Good morning. Please be seated and welcome to Mayflower Congregational United Church of Christ, where we believe that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills, and the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Here ends the reading of words inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. I hope that your Thanksgiving was a time out, a pause in the madness of these days, time to talk about something other than politics, a time to be grateful, maybe a time to take a walk, remember that a crisis is also an opportunity, and that faith is not about getting everything you want, but about wanting everything you did not know you needed. In the days ahead, we will need each other. Sean and Cass and I spent three days in Bellingham, Washington, visiting my mom and my sister and her family, and it was good. Good to see Billy Louise Bearden Myers, a remarkable woman, and to walk by the edge of the sea again to visit Lummy Island, and to see again that tiny congregational church that Annie Dillard wrote about, and the pulpit where my father sometimes preached. It was cool and blustery on the Puget Sound, but for those of us who preach, it was also a chance to look around the corner to Advent with a new sense of urgency. I'm guessing that most of you have heard this text, that's the danger, that you are too familiar with it. You've probably got it memorized. You could do super well if there was a Jeopardy category, things Isaiah said. Let's try this for 100. This is what swords will be turned into. Beep, what are plowshares? Good, good for 100. Let's try things Isaiah said for 200. This is what spears will be turned into. What are pruning hooks? Good, good for 200. Let's try things Isaiah said for 300. This is what we shall study no more. What is war? Thank you very much. (laughs) I'm not moving fast enough. (laughs) Good for 300. (laughs) Then a long silence and Alex Trebek says, well, it's your choice. And you say, I'm sorry, I was just thinking maybe the category should be things Isaiah was dead wrong about. And the top answer should be, this behemoth made trillions by studying war. And you buzz in, "Eh." what is the military industrial complex? I'm not sure what sort of timeline Isaiah had in mind, you know, which millennium. Maybe that would be a good final Jeopardy answer. But it seems like a long, long time we've been teaching these lines to our kids in Sunday school, all the while stealing their lunch money and their future to build more bombs. Eisenhower tried to warn us, we didn't listen to him either. How much do we spend? More than all the other developed nations put together. How long, O Lord, how long? It's interesting to me that just as Easter comes after Good Friday, the first Sunday of Advent comes right after Black Friday, (laughs) which it now appears some people may actually be growing tired of, weary of, you know, that Black Friday shopping frenzy where sometimes you just have to do what you have to do to get some more cheap plastic crap. 
like trample your neighbor. I mean, maybe we should study greed no more. I mean, really, who canceled these classes we used to teach? The ones where we learn to act like grown-ups and put others ahead of ourselves and solve our problems without violence. Do you know, I think we should reconvene these classes if the church wants to survive, because this is our curriculum. This is our course if we can stop worrying about who's going to heaven or how to cure gay people or why virtue matters only if it's your opponent who lacks it. Maybe then we could hold our classes again and teach this stuff that actually matters, like how to unlearn war. I mean, we have war universities, don't you know, and they crank out generals. Surely we could have a few peace universities that crank out some pacifists and some conscientious objectors, just for balance. After all, it was the first Jesus people who taught us that once you'd been baptized, you had to renounce all violence and you could put on no uniform of any army. And you could march out to kill nobody's enemy because you were too busy praying for them. I know that's weird, perhaps naive, but if the beloved community is to survive, we're gonna to have to get our weird back and put it on. When I spoke about this at Yale in the final lecture on resisting empire, I suggested the church might want to become a kind of absurdity again in order to get the world's attention, that we would become again even the object of ridicule if the cause was peace, this is how I put it. When on the 4th of July, in addition to our standard military parades, churches might want to consider having the youth group make unfloats for the unparade, something powered by a donkey, perhaps, entered under the previously unknown category, non-violent restorative justice. The press would love it. Even the cable news network named after Herod the Fox would have a field day. Imagine the commentary of the talking heads, the Christians staged their own parade for peace today. Here they are, see them right there, wearing those garlands, releasing some white doves, lovely, and carrying some unidentified object, not sure what that is, and the reporter responds, that's a pruning hook. And the anchor responds, whatever, whatever. Whatever? What if they gave a war and nobody came? You know where that familiar anti-war line from the 60s comes from? From the American poet and writer Carl Sandburg. After the devastation of the First World War, Sandburg published an epic prose poem called The People, Yes. It was 1936. And in it are these words in which a little girl sees a group of soldiers marching in a parade. Here's how it goes. The little girl saw her first troop parade and asked, what are those? Soldiers. What are soldiers? They are for war. They fight and each tries to kill as many of the other side as he can. The girl held still and studied. Do you know? I know something. Yes, what is it that you know? Sometime they'll give a war and nobody will come. It fascinates me that for Sandberg, the innocent here is a little girl who suddenly knows something by studying. She held still and studied. Then almost as if in a flash of light, she knows something. Do you know? I know something. Perhaps this is only possible because she's not learned the first lesson, which is that war is inevitable, so she doesn't have to unlearn it. We've raised our children, I think, to believe that war is inevitable, so we might as well study it, we might as well be good at it. But what if we raised a whole generation of children who thought war was not normal, but rather the aberration? I mean, where would we get that curriculum for that course? If this were a class, if, I never have had a class this big, but let's say you're all my students, and I said, so class, open your Bibles to Isaiah, and somebody will somebody volunteer to read chapters three and four. How about do we have a volunteer to read chapter three and four? Oh. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that the Lord may make his Yeah. 
Thank you, Bert. See how different that sounds coming from out there? Not so long ago, back in the 80s, when Roman Catholic bishops were more interested in protesting poverty and the nuclear arms race than in covering up child abuse, a group of dissident Catholics led by the Berrigan brothers, Daniel and Phil, broke into a nuclear weapons facility at King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and literally started beating on a nuclear warhead with hammers. They poured their own blood over documents. Their trial on 10 felony counts went on for a decade. They called themselves the Plowshare Eight. They did what they did because of what Bert just read, because that's our curriculum. Instead of just reading the text in church, singing a hymn, going to brunch, they decided to try their hand at beating swords into plowshares because nuclear weapons are now the biggest, scariest, most immoral swords on the face of the earth, and we forget about them. I don't know what people thought they were doing. I just graduated from seminary. I had an idea what they were doing, but a lot of people just thought they were crazy, those crazy Berrigan brothers. They claimed to have seen a vision, and like the prophets of old, they wanted to make it real, enact it become the dissident incarnation of this beautiful idea, this vision as old and compelling as life itself. This is the deepest yearning of the human heart, that someday we, we will all worship together on a holy mountain, we'll walk in the ways of peace, and we will study war no more. And all I want to know is, why did we think they were crazy? Now we have made a fantastic science out of war, so if we're going to update this, we should be beating our drones into solar panels, our chemical weapons into medicines, our cyber weapons into math and history programs. Our killing has become so precise, so high-tech, so removed from the reality of any battlefield that we forget the results are the same. We make widows and orphans. We steal the future and snuff it out. We lay waste to the fields and we mock creation itself. When Isaiah wrote these words, which also appear in Micah, two prophetic voices, they were contemporaries, the 8th century BCE, things didn't look good for the people in exile or for the God of justice they claimed to worship. So Isaiah claims to have seen a vision. Do you notice how it begins? The word that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw. Do you notice that? Saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He and his band of dissident prophets imagined a time in the future when Rome would not have the last word and when God would dwell on Mount Zion in the midst of God's people and all the nations would be judged and rebuked if they did not walk in the light. Now, what does this mean for us, you and me, on the good ship Mayflower? I think it is that this text begins Advent because it's about a day that's coming, but we will not see it in our lifetime. It begins with a sound, the sound of hammers striking metal. They are swords being beaten into plowshares. That's how the church begins its year. Advent is New Year's Day in the church. And we begin with a deliberate vision of peace followed by a deliberate act of sabotage. Weapons are converted into instruments for the production of food. Symbols of death are converted into symbols of life. And that's the word I want us to consider this morning, conversion. It's an old word, an old religious sounding word, conversion. It's usually understood as it applies to an individual, as when a sinner converts or a non-believer converts to become a believer. Or people speak of converting from one religious tradition to another, Sometimes when one partner in a marriage converts to the religion of their spouse, we call that conversion, but the church is insisting that to begin Advent, we convert in a different way. Our first act is to become alchemists for peace. I'm a child of the Cold War, of duck and cover in school. What a cruel hoax. Of the Cuban Missile Crisis that almost brought the world to an end. New information just out about those nine days in October confirms that deep inside Cheyenne Mountain, NORAD, near our cabin in Colorado, NORAD was locked and loaded and everyone was told to send a final message to their loved ones without telling them why. 
That's how close we came. When the Cold War finally ended and the Berlin Wall came down, we thought there might be a peace dividend, but our military spending never missed a beat. We just kept building bigger and bigger swords. And now mechanized weapons of war mean, means we kill from thousands of miles away with the click of a mouse on a computer screen. We don't see the carnage on the ground. We do not look into the eyes of the dead. We kill remotely, and then we go home for dinner. And the military budget, you know, is not like a stimulus package. As any economist will tell you, the military budget is an expenditure, not an investment. It's what economists call a non-contributive activity. So a tank is not like an automobile that keeps generating economic activity. It's built and then kept ready, but doesn't get repaired at the local garage. It doesn't have treads that it buys from Firestone. It never goes through the local car wash, green or otherwise. Our tax dollars purchase the tank and then we hope never to have to use it. So we store it. And while Eisenhower is best known for coining the phrase military industrial complex, he was much more poetic when he said this, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. Now, it's no coincidence that the two most successful industrial economies to challenge the United States have been the same two economies prevented by World War II terms of surrender from building massive military forces, Germany and Japan. We essentially converted their economic systems by forbidding them to do what we have done, which is to beat plowshares into swords. Now that a shadow's fallen across the land in the form of a president-elect who says the military's terrible and we must pass the biggest spending increase in history, the church, I think, has an opportunity to <clears throat> clear its throat and go underground again and resist this rampant machismo with the most countercultural message of all. This is not the meaning of strength. Indeed, this is the beginning of the end of all empires. This is how they end. I've often talked with my mom and I did this Thanksgiving again about the GI Bill, which paid for my father's graduate school education and, and sent his whole generation to college. It's, it's how my parents bought a house and became productive members of the greatest generation. And that program, which nobody thought of as socialism, was an investment with an enormous rate of return. The extra federal taxes collected out of the higher incomes earned by returning soldiers because of their extra training and reintegration into a new workforce amounted to 30 times the program's cost. That is, the government got back $30 for every $1 it spent on the GI Bill. And we need a new GI Bill for all our workers in this country because now all our graduates have to show for their degrees is a crushing student debt, and that's a drag on the economy. I teach a course every year at OCU called Moral Issues, Peace, and Nonviolence. It's a peace studies class, and we study peace the way the world has long studied war, wondering what it would take to study it no more. And I always show the class an interview between Bill Moyers and Greg Mortensen, author of Three Cups of Tea, the builder of schools in Afghanistan, whose father was a Presbyterian minister and who gave his son Greg, at age nine, a copy of Schweitzer's remarkable book entitled Erfucht von dem Leben. Most people translate this reverence for life, but the German words more closely translate to be in awe of the mystery of life. The idea came to Schweitzer, he said, when he was riding on a boat in equatorial Africa, searching, he said, for a universal ethic to end violence. At the end of the interview, in the classroom, I flip on the lights and I notice some of my students have, have tears in their eyes. And although we're not in church, I can tell you that what sometimes occurs in the classroom is in fact a conversion, a small but powerful recognition that our present ways are unsustainable and that Teenagers and young people need to be paying attention. And this is not classic evangelism, but I do trust those students will go out and convert others. And by this faith, I live. 
even in the days through which we are passing now. It will require resistance. The church will have to remember that it was once a community of spiritual defiance, not a place to do Christian aerobics, whatever that is, buy books about the end times, scare children into thinking all their brown neighbors are terrorists or all gay people need to be cured. That's not our curriculum. That's false. Isaiah 2, 1 to 5 is our curriculum. In the days ahead, we will hope for the best, but we'll be prepared for the worst. And our most powerful way of resisting empire will be to starve the beast, to practice non-compliance whenever possible. That is, to resist violence in all its forms and to refuse to allow those who profit from fear to have their way with us. We will fear not. That's also in our curriculum. Nothing more powerful could happen in the Church of Jesus Christ today than for baptism to once again symbolize not who's saved, but who has decided to renounce all violence. It might make people think twice about getting baptized in the first place. And then we need a department of peace and a modest budget so we can study something other than war for a change. Friends, we've got to get our weird back on. For starters, this really is New Year's Day in the church. And even though we're not singing Old Lang Syne, the first day of Advent is the beginning of an alternative calendar. So let's keep it weird. Let's keep it going right through the madness of the holidays and march to the beat of a different drummer and resist the compulsion to buy stuff we don't need and refuse to listen to or practice the rhetoric of the chosen white man. I shall not follow the chosen white man. People are making Nazi salutes. And we can do it because we have an alternative curriculum in an alternative community with an alternative calendar sustained by a radically alternative vision. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations, shall arbitrate for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Did you see that? Not did you hear that, did you see that? Neither shall they learn war anymore. I see it. 